Atlantica refers, at least in geographical terms, to a cross-border region spanning the Maritime Provinces, Newfoundland, most of New England, the southern parts of Quebec, and upstate New York. In policy terms, it refers to a continental deep integration push that, that aims to turn this region into a conduit for Asian goods destined for the U.S. heartland to accelerate Atlantic-Canadian energy exports to the United States and embark on a, on a process of deregulation and unaccountable corporate rule, and I, and I use that term very advisedly because it's really the best one I could come up with, that would harm the majority of citizens on both sides of the border. It is a highly ideological vision of the region's future. Atlantica's chosen theme of business without borders has, has a double meaning. Not only business unimpeded by the international border, but also freed from environmental regulation, social protection such as minimum wages, social program spending, public ownership, and unionization, which have been specifically identified by Atlantica's proponents as policy distress factors. In, in our region. On the Canadian side, again, as Claire has mentioned, this process is being driven by a right-wing think tank, a very well-resourced one, the Atlantic Institute for Market Studies, the region's largest corporations organized through the Atlantic uh, Regional Chamber of Commerce, the Nova Scotia Provincial Government, and at the federal level by the Privy Council Office, the Prime Minister's Office, and the federal government's internal think tank, the Policy Research Institute. Now, Atlantica fits into the broader drive towards continental deep integration with the United States, the Security and Prosperity Partnership, and signals a major shift in federal regional economic development policy towards the Atlantic provinces. I'm going to focus a little bit on two of the main planks, uh, transportation and uh, energy, and then discuss a little bit of uh, alternatives and strategies uh, to contest Atlantica. Now, a central goal of the Atlantic project is to develop Halifax as a port of entry for a high-volume highway transporting Asian products to the United States. Now, it's important to emphasize that the primary focus of the envisaged Atlantic Transportation Corridor is not to strengthen trade between Atlantic Canada and New England. In fact, Brian Lee Crowley, the executive director of Ames, dismisses the tra trade within the region, and I quote, as, as barely worth mentioning. The Atlantica plan is for the region to position itself as a conduit for goods produced elsewhere in Asia for consumption elsewhere, the U.S. heartland. The pitch for the Atlantica Transportation Corridor goes as follows. Global container traffic has been growing rapidly, and as, a and as Asian manufactured goods inundate North American markets, projected cargo volumes are straining the ability of West Coast ports to handle them. With the development of so-called post-Panamax ships, these are container ships that are too large to pass through the Panama Canal, Halifax is well positioned as the closest North American deep water port for ships from Asia via the Suez Canal route. Now, attracting enough of these leviathans, a single vessel can carry 10,000 containers, or container equivalents, or more, offers the chance, again in Crowley's own words, to increase traffic flows to levels far in excess of what our own local population and, and economic activity could justify. Needless to say, boosting traffic to levels out of all proportion to local needs would create some serious problems for, for the people who actually live here. Even double stacked 10,000 containers would create a line of trucks st stretching well over 20 miles long. That's, that's a single ship. The limited economic spin-offs of this dubious strategy would be almost entirely concentrated in the port of Halifax. Meanwhile, especially if as envisaged, the bulk of this massive expansion in container traffic is shipped onwards by truck, there would be significant environmental safety and maintenance impacts, not only in Halifax, but all along the proposed Atlantic Corridor route. For instance, Crowley insists that Canadian and U.S. regulations on vehicle weights and dimensions be weakened to permit the operation of truck trains. Now, truck trains are much bigger, heavier trucks with more than one, one trailer per tractor. These are, again, these are truly Leviathans. They, the largest uh, so-called turnpike doubles can be over a, 100 feet, well over 100 feet long. And, you know, the big trucks that are on our highway now uh, have trailers about 50 feet. 
Now, putting many more bigger and heavier trucks on the region's roads would result in significantly higher bridge and highway maintenance costs. The increase in truck traffic would, would result in higher greenhouse gas emissions. And last, but certainly not least, large, large trucks have higher fatality, higher fatal crash rates, and putting more of them on the road would be deadly. Now, currently, U.S. federal law limits the total weight of trucks and trailers, including cargo, to 80,000 pounds. There are some exceptions in certain states. While some Canadian provinces already allow trucks up to 138,000 pounds. So, and there is already direct pressure, as I'm sure Sean will speak about, to weaken U.S. regulations along the route of the proposed Atlantica Highway. So this is a case where U.S. federal regulations are more, more protective than Canadian. And, and it's just one practical example of how Atlantica feeds into and drives deregulation. Now, the second major plank of the Atlantica vision is accelerated energy exports from the Atlantic offshore to the United States. Ames and other Atlantica backers, including the Harper government, stressed that energy exports should be unregulated, with decisions left entirely to private market forces. Now, of course, uh, this myth of, of private market forces in energy, of course, ignores public ownership of these resources in Canada, the significant public subsidies and incentives available to develop them, and their importance both economically and environmentally to the future of this region and the country. Uh, you know, the typical offshore developers are, are guaranteed a rate of return after their production costs, which is a, an interesting uh, variant of the, of the free market. Let's call it a private market. Uh, the, bulk of, the bulk of Scotia Scotian shelf natural gas is currently exported to the Boston, New England market. New Brunswick and PEI consumers have been unable to gain access to new incremental supplies, just new supplies coming on stream, even though they're willing to pay market prices. Now, there are significant potential socioeconomic and environment, environmental benefits, particularly in terms of meeting Canada's Kyoto Accord commitments, if Atlantic Canadians could gain greater access to a portion of the offshore natural gas supplies that are currently being exported. Canada's reserves of natural gas are running out. The proportional sharing requirements of NAFTA could lock in export flows at levels that will deny Atlantic Canadians access to domestic energy supplies when future shortfalls arise, and they will arise. The Harper government has pointedly refused to back the province in its dispute with Exxon. It will be essential to convince municipalities and other provincial governments, other than the Nova Scotia one government, that the focus on the Atlantic a Transportation Corridor will impose significant costs on communities and taxpayers along the proposed route and ignore the needs of communities in other parts of the region. It will be essential to contrast this misuse of public infrastructure spending with the benefits from improvements to municipal services, upgrading transportation networks within the region, and other major investments with greater economic development potential, such as extending broad-based, broadband internet networks throughout the region. Canada desperately needs a long-term energy policy that conserves non-renewable resources and uses them wisely in a, in a transition to safe, renewable forms of energy. The Atlantica region needs to negotiate fairer terms for access to publicly owned resources and to ensure that energy revenues are invested with an eye to when these non-renewable resources will be gone. The region needs an alternative vision of ener energy sustainability that would put it at the forefront of efforts to reduce carbon and greenhouse gas emissions in Canada and globally. And such a plan would set clear targets and timelines for reducing emissions. Under the guise of eliminating the so-called tyranny of small differences, in regulation between the two countries, the continental corporate sector is pursuing a deregulation agenda where government officials directly respond to corporate complaints with little transparency, accountability, or broader democratic participation. <clears throat> this agenda leaves citizens in both countries with weaker regulatory protection. We need to advance a different model of regulatory cooperation based on emulating the highest standards continentally and globally and supporting the democratic right of individual jurisdictions to develop leadership standards that are higher than existing standards. This is often called the California effect because of the leadership they've shown on fuel emission standards, greenhouse gases, and so on. So 
So to conclude, the majority of citizens on both sides of the border are excluded from Atlantic as a least driven decision-making structure. Like the overall security and prosperity partnership of which it forms a part, Atlantica has been deliberately designed to proceed without citizen or even legislative involvement and oversight. It does not provide either Canadians or U.S. citizens with a voice in its largely informal, elite-driven regional structures. This is particularly pronounced for Canadians, since Washington's policy towards Canada is driven by U.S. domestic interests and security concerns over which Canadians have no control and little influence. Despite their flaws, national, provincial, state, and local governments and legal systems do provide citizens on both sides of the border with participatory rights and a democratic voice. Basic rights that are seriously compromised by the Atlantica vision. Thank you.